So I'm very excited to be here today. After nine years of partnering with Shanti Bhavan, I think that this is the first time we've ever shared a stage, which means I have nine years worth of questions to ask <laughs> both of these gentlemen. Um, and we will have an opportunity for audience Q&A as well. So I encourage you, if you have questions of your own, to hold on to them because I'll be coming for you next. Dr. George, I want to hear from you first. Originally, you were working in finance. And so I think we'd all just love to hear a little bit more about what compelled you to leave the financial life behind and to start Shanti Bhavan. Well, it goes back many years before I, I got myself into finance, uh, Wall Street and all of that. Um, it, actually, from the time I was a military officer in India, traveling all over India, seeing poverty and uh, social discrimination. And uh, at that early age of 19 or 20, I, I um, felt that uh, uh, that's where I want to end up one day. So coming to the United States and studying and having a job in my own company, that was a means to an end. Um, um, and the end was uh, dealing with uh, social discrimination and uh, economic opportunities. So that was burning inside me. So uh, this uh, inspiration, I didn't get it from anywhere else. It was just uh, watching, uh, watching poor people, how the affluent society was looking down at them and treating them, and knowing very well that uh, uh, if you give opportunity, just like I had, coming to America and studying and so on, uh, they can do well. I was convinced that was possible. So the inspiration is purely uh, uh, born out of what I had seen. Mm. I didn't realize you had had the idea so young. We actually, um, my co-founder and I, Tammy, had the idea. We were 20 and 23. Tammy is here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and um, I often say that part of the reason we started She's the First was youthful naivete. So i um, <laughs> Glad to see that we had that in common. Ajit, um, going into a family business or a family organization is not always an easy decision. So I would love to hear from you, what made you decide to join your father in his work? Because you, you hadn't always. Yeah. Uh, at first it was necessity. Um, we were, um, the 2008 crisis um, took a real toll on our family and took a real toll on the organization. And, um, you know, my father uh, asked me to step up and help uh, with what we were doing. Uh, that, uh, that opened the door to seeing how important the work was. And um, what I do now, uh, working with Shanti Bhavan has transformed my life. It has become more than a job or work. Uh, it is a cause and a mission that has fulfilled my life uh, and has been powerful in shaping who I am and what I see can be done in the world. Um, so uh, I think it's an easy, easy choice now, but it wasn't initially. Yeah, yeah. I, grew to, I really grew to love it. Do you ever find the dynamic between father and boss and son <laughs> and employee to be a... A challenging yes. one? It, it, especially in the early years, it, it's complicated, right? You, you see your father, um, and then he's your boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what has been extraordinary is that I've gotten to get a lot closer with him and got to understand his vision, uh, who he is, what he sees, um, and I think vice versa, that we have a, a genuinely um, beautiful shared relationship. Um, in service to something bigger than either one of us, um, bigger than either one of us could accomplish on our own. Mm -hmm. And doing this together has been an incredibly uh, meaningful and powerful journey for me. I just want to be sure that uh, you all understand it's not a family business. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens that uh, I could tap him to do help me. That's, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> and Ajay, you, you referenced how big this is and kind of how big the work that you're doing is. And Dr. George, when you first started this, you had a very specific vision. You wanted to work with some of the poorest of the poor in India. 
Why did you decide to focus there? What were the challenges or obstacles that you saw people facing that, that you really wanted to change? Well, it was very clear to me from the time um, I traveled in India that um, a great majority, maybe two thirds of India's population at that time, uh, 40, 50 years ago, they were extremely poor. And then uh, I also realized that some 250 million people are called untouchables. And uh, they are looked down upon, like Kartika said in the film. And I was looking for <coughs> um, a, a solution to the problem. And the world's uh, approach to the problem was literacy programs, uh, bare minimum education, and they get them a job so they can feed their families. It didn't appeal to me. And, uh, and <coughs> given the large numbers, there's no way um, a few people uh, impacted by, by programs like this can take care of the problem. They, in turn, must be able to take care of hundreds of others. So I was quite, quite convinced from uh, my experience in America that uh, the trick is to multiply the effect, mm -hmm. which is to say that, like uh, some of these kids said, that uh, their mission in life is after they take care of their families, they should go out and help strangers in need. And I tell them, listen, it doesn't have to be in India. It can be in Africa. It can be anywhere. Uh, but before your time is over, you should have at least, that's the yardstick I gave them, at least 100 others you must touch, maybe millions more, you know, if you are in a great position. So that multiplicative effect is the solution. And that is possible only if they, these kids are extremely successful. And we have, in these 23 years, shown or proved that they can be successful. They are extremely successful. They are empowered to change the world. And beautiful children, and, uh, and they, they are on a mission. And uh, not just professionally successful, but uh, children who grow up uh, with uh, uh, moral authority, um, do the right thing, speak always uh, truth, the truth, and be humble, uh, so many other qualities that make us human. And uh, so that's what uh, all of us uh, who are in Shandibon are striving to do, not just give them a good education, but also to bring them up well so that they'll be good human beings. Mm -hmm. And the obstacles, the obstacles were, uh, there are always obstacles, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, but I made some decisions uh, right from day one that a, uh, there are no government officials here, I can't say this, um, <laughs> that I will not deal with the government. Uh, because in India, if you uh, take money from the government for any reason, then they will, they will demand bribes. So that was one rule I followed. Mm -hmm. um, there are many other rules, uh, but, um, uh, you know, you saw that taking body parts and so on, that they were initial obstacles. Uh, the landlords, so the, the village leaders were against us because we were impacting the society. The so-called um, untouchables were now becoming uh, more powerful. Their children are going to do well better than the landlord's children. So we were creating social you know, uh, disturbance for them. And so, um, they were against us. Um, there were attempts to even kill me. Uh, but, you know, you have to find your way through. You, you don't get into this unless you are ready to face those things. So I don't, I don't think of those obstacles as anything, uh, you know, big, big deal. You just have to walk your way through. The problem with having someone like Dr. George as a mentor is that you're never allowed to have an excuse for anything, <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, but the children, too, have many, many obstacles, both when they, they start Shanti Bhavan, throughout their time at Shanti Bhavan. Ajit, maybe you can share some of what the children are facing as they come to you. Yeah. Um, from a, it's interesting. From a working graduate perspective, when I first started uh, with Shanti Bhavan, I think I thought of... Um, the problem of poverty is uh, simply an income problem. Uh, if, a, if a child makes or a person makes over X amount of dollars per year, they're out of poverty. If they make under X amount of dollars per year, they're in poverty. 
what I s learned over all the years that I've worked with the organization is uh, poverty is complex, uh, and, and poverty takes many forms. Uh, it can be sexual and physical abuse. It can be alcoholism. It can be uh, generational debt. Um, it can be, um, you know, a, a misogynistic system. And all of these different pressures combined uh, will continue to push down a child. So our working graduates, for instance, are working in these fantastic companies like you know, Goldman Sachs or Amazon, uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, and so on. And their careers are fantastic, and they, they see a world ahead of them. And yet, simultaneously, the pressures of poverty are pulling them down. Um, you know, one of the starkest uh, cases is uh, generational poverty, uh, debts uh, incurred by their parents, maybe even their grandparents' time, uh, to illegal money lenders. And they cannot escape that. Um, you know, I'll give you just a story that, that really illustrates this. Uh, it was my father's birthday, and a young man by the name of Anith, who at the time were, was working at Deloitte. He'd started at EY, he moved over to Deloitte. If you met him, he would be the most polished, well-spoken uh, young man. You would never have guessed uh, the kind of circumstances and hardships that he comes from. He was there to celebrate the, my father's birthday. Uh, but he was on his phone um, talking to somebody I didn't know who at the time, and he seemed really uh, disturbed. And I said, you know, Anith, come on, let's, uh, let's go. My father's going to go blow out the candles. And he said, um, no, no, I need to use your computer for a minute. And I said, sure, but what's going on? He said, I need to move money from my account to the bank account I set up for my parents because there are money lenders at their door, and if, I don't, if they don't give them the money now, they will beat my parents up. And... Um, I just, I just stared at him in blank disbelief for, for a minute. Um, this was this like, incredibly well-polished young man who has this great career in Bangalore. And on the other hand, um, there is another part of his life that is still trapped in poverty, where his parents uh, struggle to make ends meet. Um, and he takes care of all of their costs. He is the sole breadwinner for the entire family. So everything from food on the table to health care to the roof over their head to clothes on their back, everything is taken care of by him. And he set up a bank account for them, and he creates a budget for them, and he gives them the money. But if he doesn't move money in that moment to their account, um, his parents will be beaten up by moneylenders. And that is one of the obstacles that I think um, I've come to realize, and we've come to realize as an organization, is it isn't so simple. And that, the, that is why Shanti Bhavan was created. Because simple answers to poverty don't exist. They are much more complicated than you think. So we have to arm our children with complex tools to face those challenges. Powerful education, strong mentorship, career opportunities, abilities to pay off those debts and to raise them up forward. Um, a lot of our kids are really excited about their futures and want to build their own companies. And you know, much like you know, people in the US, that are, they're, 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 they're these bright entrepreneurs and ready to do things. But unlike me, who grew up in a family uh, of wealth and privilege, that if I made mistakes, and let me tell you, I've made a hundred of them, I always had my father to step up and take care of me when I made a mistake. I always knew that if I fell, he would pick me up, that my mother would pick me up, my aunts and uncles would pick me up, my grandparents would pick me up. It's the opposite. They can't take those risks, because if they take a risk and they fail, everything goes downhill for their entire family. All the food, all the, all the electricity, all the clothes, everything is at risk when they take a single risk. So they can't risk building companies because everyone depends on them. And these are some of the challenges. There's so many more going on. Uh, but they're really complex challenges. And so as an organization, we are constantly in conversation with our working graduates trying to solve those problems. And this is something I've heard Ajit talk about before. I've heard you describe this as the web of poverty, yeah. which I thought was such a, a potent metaphor. Um, and I thought about it again when I was re-watching the clip just now because Tanmari says multiple times in just that clip that she needs to get a good job so she can send money to her mom yeah. or she needs to take care of her mom. Yeah. Her mom and, and her mother's well-being, it figures so largely in her imagination even as a seven-year-old. And I wonder, because too, in this film, you know, there's a, a tagline about how Shanti Bhavan cares for children from their first day of school to their first day on the job. But that's not actually true, is it? Because I know that you're in constant contact with these, these adults as they yeah. go out into the world and they're navigating situations yeah. like the one that you just meant. 
um, or the one that you just mentioned. So I wonder, you know, did you anticipate kind of keeping in such close contact throughout and how have you managed to, to take on not just school, but also university and, and that, those steps into adulthood? Honestly, I didn't think that uh, the program will go to college and beyond. But then I, I, uh, I found out something about myself, and, and that happened almost 12 years after I started the school. Uh, I was being, um, the school was being photographed by, I mean, videotaped by uh, an anchor woman from, uh, from ABC News in London. And after she spent, spent the day and was walking with me along the pavers of school, and she uh, turned to me and said, um, Abraham, I can see that you love the kids and the kids love you, but tell me, uh, tell me, what have you learned about yourself that you didn't know? Mm. Um, and I hadn't thought in those um, uh, ways, uh, but I had my. Um, I suddenly came to the realization that uh, the, about myself, which was that I didn't know when I first started that I could love three hundred kids same mm. way as I love him. And today, I can honestly tell you that there is no difference between him and any of those 300 kids. And they see me as their dad. And if you can do that, how can you leave them uh, after school? How can you leave them after college? How can you leave them anytime? As long as I live, I'm for them. And I get every other day something. Today, one of the kids wrote to me saying that I got the job at Mercedes Benz. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, hey, uh, some sweet note I always said. <laughs> yes, Preeta, darling, you got, oh, I'm so happy for you. And I look forward to coming and having a cup of coffee with you when I come back. You know. So you have to be there for them. And the, the most powerful, powerful weapon you have, uh, well, the, not the weapon, the most powerful thing you can do for them is to love them. And they have to know that you love them. And if you do, and if you really do, then you have the ability to impact them and guide them and change them, you know, and they make mistakes, you correct them, and they wouldn't mind. Mm. So Shanti Bhavan's mission is to empower children from impoverished backgrounds to take control of their lives and bring positive change to their families, and communities. And I've always really loved that phrasing because it puts the focus directly on the students, on the children, as being the, the change makers. And I think that's fairly unique in the NGO world. A lot of times organizations like to talk about the change that they create. But Shanti Bhavan is so focused on the change that your students, that your kids is creating, are creating in the world. Um, and I'd love to hear about what are some of the other elements of Shanti Bhavan's model or philosophy that you really think sets Shanti Bhavan apart? Let him try first and then... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, what it sets us apart? I, I think it's the deep intervention. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I think it's the deep intervention uh, in our, our overall philosophy. Uh, there are... There are two pillars that I think of for Shanti Bhavan. One is excellence. Uh, in everything we do, um, we strive towards excellence. And this is something that my father set forward first. Uh, I think by his own career looked at um, how he succeeded. And that was being uh, excellent and striving towards success in everything he did. And we do that for our kids too. Um, there's often a misconception or an internal bias that I think society has, which is to say we think children from poverty have only, or people from poverty, can only do so much and no more. Um, that, that person on the street, you know, we feel sorry for them, but we also think perhaps maybe that is where they, they that's the, the most they can get to. And um, we think they can only succeed to a certain level, but that maybe they will never sit at the same dining, dining table with us and share a meal with us or occupy the same office with us and have the same job. And society, I think, has this um, bias, and we act on that bias by the resources, the limited resources we give, 
to poverty alleviation and education programs. Um, when you do that, um, a child from poverty will know it. Right? If you look at a child and say, my expectations are you're only going to get you know, X grade, or it's okay if you do so well but not this well. And we, if you lower your standard, people will perform to that lowered standard. Shanti Bhavan has the opposite. We have set high standards and an expectation of excellence with the resources to get there. And we don't, uh, we don't say, no, it's okay if you do really poorly. We say, no, you have to do really well. We want you to do well. We will give you the resources to do well. Uh, and we have expectations of that. And I think that is a really different outlook than I have seen from other models. Uh, the second uh, aspect that I think that sets us apart is a strong sense of social and civic responsibility. We believe that they, all of us, have a responsibility to our fellow brothers and sisters, to our fellow members of society. We are an interconnected community of people. We're not islands. We, uh, we, we did not get to where we are by ourselves. All of us did something as part of a group other people came before us and built things, and they gave us opportunities and opened up doors for us. And what we tell the kids are, you, you don't owe me or my father or any donor or any supporter or she's the first anything. They're, they're nobody's looking for your, their money back, and they're not looking for some, something back from you. But you do owe it to people who are left behind. You do owe it to those who have never given the opportunities that you have. And that if you have any responsibility in this society, it is to pay it forward and to uplift others like you have been uplifted by those who come before you. And I think that really sets us apart. If I may yeah. add, um, you have, we have to, to uh, deal with the children every minute of the day and through, all through um, the same way as um, I dealt with you or you know, your own children, yeah, our own children. Um, they have to know you're there for them all the time. It is not like just, oh, I'm going to give you education, I'm going to give you food and you work hard and, you know, that type of thing. No, they have to feel uh, a belonging. They have to feel a sense of security. They have to know that you love them every minute of the day. You have to, you have to uh, be there for them, and that is possible. That is possible only if you genuinely love them. I, that, that, that is a little difficult in the NGO world because you have to be there for each child. Um, you know, when I am there, uh, I hardly do any paperwork at all. I am all the time, um, you know, uh, walking by the corridor and doing this to the hair or pulling somebody's ears, you know, make, or making eye contact or whatever that is so that the kids know um, that, I'm there. And if I do for 25 kids today and do another 25 tomorrow, in a week I would have covered all the kids, you know. Um, that is my job, actually, apart from, of course, the staff. You have to motivate the staff. Uh, they have to buy into the mission. All of that is very important. Um, but the way we are, this um, work that I, I think is different from most of the NGOs is that personal a total commitment to children. So I'm about out of time, and so I have just two questions I have to get in. So they're going to be very, very fast. But Ajay, I'd love to hear, in as few words as possible, <laughs> when you think 5, 10, 20 years in the future, where are your kids? Um, I think they're building companies, and I think they're building NGOs, and I think they're running for political office. But most of all, I think they're building systems that neither my father and I can envision. New systems of government and new systems of doing business, uh, born out of poverty, but uh, built out of success. And those systems will hopefully transform society. I see of our kids as uh, societal change makers. Mm. And in one word, because I really enjoy the theme of this, of this um, whole endeavor by the age of society, I would love to know, in one word, what does it take to change life? You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> this is when he gets to be the dad. 
I don't know. I, maybe I am a little more emotional thing about it. Um, one word is love. Mm. Follow that up, Ajit. Uh, that's a tough one to follow up, but um, I'd say passion. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there are so many things you got to do. I mean, hundreds of things I can <laughs> list, but uh, if you if you don't have love for them, it won't work. Mm. Okay. Thank you both for answering my <laughs> questions. I would like to turn it out to the audience now. So, if there are questions out here, we have a microphone. Let's go here. I actually have a couple of questions. Um, so I, I presume that this is a boarding school that children attend and all through the year, and they probably go home for the summer and be with their parents, Twice. something like that. Yeah. So um, the couple of questions are, uh, I, and I understand the fact that when you say that you give a child the opportunity, they, they do really well, they thrive. Uh, but what do you do with children I mean, in a class, there are bound to be children who lag behind and they have trouble catching up. How do you deal with that? Uh, because, you know, here in public schools, there's a very big problem of uh, kids struggling and them getting kids to perform. Um, so I wanted to hear that. And I have another question about, uh, since you were talking about the village panchayats or the landowners, uh, wanting, I mean, being angry with you, have you opened up admission to allow their children uh, to come in and study, you know, so that there's no antagonism, you know, built in in the community? Thank you. Yeah, spot. yeah I'll answer the first part. Um, over the first, the, the early years, we had uh, a higher level of attrition because we did not understand how to handle some of these challenges. Um, we have learned pretty well, though, over the last 21 years of the organization's, uh, the school's existence, that there are multiple ways to reach a child that are struggling, um, and we have instituted them. Some of them are peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. Uh, and peer-to-peer -to -peer tutoring is very effective. But uh, a lot of extra help from teachers, um, from our volunteer staff, uh, from their own peers. We have a very strong um, policy of ensuring that every child can pass our, our exams as well as the national exams, the ICSC and the ISC exams, which are the two of the toughest, if you're familiar with the system, the two of the toughest national exams. And with these um, individualized high level of intervention per child, it has been very effective. And so our resources are well spent in that regard. Every, day, every week, every Friday, uh, we have myself, and there is another lady um, whose husband is a doctor. Uh, we have Skype calls when we are here. We go through every child uh, in the higher grades uh, who have problems. And then we jointly with the staff, we figure out what's the solution. So it doesn't mean that we'll always be perfectly successful. Uh, our mission is not necessarily to uh, to produce those who are going to get 99 percentile or something like that. We would rather have kids who do, right now, the 85 percent is the minimum that we want the children to have. But we want them to be all around holistic, uh, you know, uh, capabilities. So um, in that sense, uh, somebody may, might say that there are schools that are doing better than us, you know, academically, which we we are not trying to. We are not trying to train them for, for example, the IITs of India. It's not one of our goals. Uh, but uh, I feel that our kids will succeed just as well, if not better, by being all round and communicative. And you saw these kids at the early age. So that's that. Now the other part of the question, uh, but we do fail in some cases and we lose some kids. Uh, in the the other part of it, uh, we are very tough. We will not budge with demands. Um, there have been panchayat officials who said they are going to burn down the school. So we we have our own group, uh, we locals from another place who will confront them. Uh, we have taken uh, uh, government officials to high court, uh, writ uh, you know petitions filed. Even the collector of the district, we we take them to court. And uh, we fight it out. Uh, they, withdraw, they ask us to withdraw, and they keep quiet. 
There have been instances where the deputy collector comes with a bulldozer to uh, plow the whole road, access road, because we supposedly went into some portion of their road. Um, and uh, we even took the sub-collector to court. So if you give in once, you lost. And that is an investment that uh, we make. And we have our own groups of people in the community who are willing to confront these people. Well, not said, because one of your policies is also that those who work for you from the surrounding community, they do have a slot at Shanti Bhavan for their children, right? Right. We have their children there. We build homes for them, houses for them. We have uh, <coughs> a f um, savings plan where they put in some savings and we match that. We drill wells for them. We repair the uh, schools, uh, government schools. So we can't live in isolation in this community. We, we, can't, we have to take care of the village too, mm -hmm. but not in a big way, in a small way. There's a question from the moderator inbox that um, I'm very excited about, actually. Um, and they say, I caught something in Dr. George's comments about why India. He said India was poorer then. It does lead to thinking about India's rapid growth and the increasing number of wealthy Indians and the growing middle class. There. And so they're just wondering, has this impacted your work? Do you see increased generosity or donations, um, increased volunteers from within India and the growing middle and upper classes there? Okay. The first part of the question being, um, uh, what was that? Um, the first part was... Um, um, that you had said that India was poorer then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I could have gone to Africa. It would have made no difference. But I have a comparative advantage. I look like an Indian. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't speak any of the languages. The only language I can speak is English. You saw me uh, speaking in English. They're translating for me. But I found out very quickly that you don't need to speak the language. Uh, they figure it out from your facial expressions and whether you care. Uh, and now, you know, I have broken language here and there, I manage, you know. But that's not a handicap. So the answer is that, uh, yeah, I, it could have been elsewhere. I would love to work with uh, another country, you know. Mm. Maybe I'll work with you one day. <laughs> um, the second part uh, of the question uh, is to do with... Um, the growing middle and upper class in India. Yeah. Have you seen increased um, generosity there? I find the non-resident Indians, like him, who were born here of Indian origin, are very different from my generation. Uh, they don't have all these burdens that, uh, or uh, preferences that uh, my generation grew up with. Oh, which uh, uh, religion are you? Which caste are you? Which is this and that, you know? Uh, the NRI, as they call them, non-resident Indians, they are willing to uh, uh, to help anyone from any state, uh, any religion. So it's exciting. Uh, a, a large portion of our donation comes from the non-resident Indians and other from uh, non-Indians in America. Uh, and I find that uh, America is, uh, is the place where we get a great majority of our funds from. Uh, strangers uh, in the mail who watch them film and then they send the check. Um, people in India, it's a little harder. I don't like to say anything negative, but um, it is not very easy to get money in India. I'll leave it as that. Um, <laughs> we go back here in gray. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. And my question is, how on earth do you choose which child mm. comes to you? Because there must be so many children. So how do you determine, do they have to apply? Just give us some sort of idea of how the process works. Very helpful. Yeah, in the initial stage, we had to go to the villages, some 80 villages we went and told the story. And, and you saw uh, there, the all kinds of uh, rumors, the landlord spread, and it was difficult. But today, some 300, 400 families come. It is heartbreaking. <coughs> All of them, uh, or a great majority of them, do deserve to have their kids join us. We can only take 24. That's why Ajit is trying to create the second Shandibon, and hopefully, in his lifetime, many more Shandibons will open. 
Uh, it is a tough decision. We select on the basis of A, the income level, it has to be below the poverty level, which is uh, uh, today it's like two or three dollars per day for a family of four or five. Uh, that is a minimum, uh, I mean, that is a requirement. If they are above that, they cannot. And so we have to go and see their heart and so on to be sure they are not cheating us. And uh, then single mothers and orphans, uh, I mean, children uh, who are orphans, uh, they, they get preference. Uh, and the third, it's a subjective thing, you know, we have to sort of figure out where the kid is, will succeed because we can't lower the standard. And that has not been very good. We have not been very good at that, you know, <laughs> figuring it out at three and a half, four, whether the child will succeed later on, you know. So. We also um, put an emphasis on, we try to make sure that the families are committed to the program. We don't want uh, a family to pull their daughter out at 12 or 13 and marry her off or pull out their son at, at 14 and put him in the field to work or put him in a quarry to work. They have to be invested in the program and believe in the program, the longevity of the program. Um, back left was up first. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but with so much need in India and elsewhere, have you got a strategy for scaling either building it yourself or doing a training center for others that want to take the model, whether it's, you know, Uganda or Haiti or elsewhere in India? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be very nice if uh, we could identify people uh, who uh, demonstrate their leadership and their commitment to the cause and they're willing to do and they can find the resources for doing it. We'll be more than happy to train them in Chandibhavan. We are more than happy to uh, have them stay with us. Uh, our hope is that the children of Chandibhavan in 10 years will begin to, to create Chandibhavans. But anywhere, any country, they want to spend uh, time with us as long as they can demonstrate that they, are, they mean what they are saying, we'll be happy to do that. Over the years, we've had a number of uh, organizations and individuals come to us um, with the desire to learn from us. One of the challenges we've noticed is that uh, they've altered the model, so it no longer becomes, it's no longer what we've designed. Some of them do a mixed model. Uh, there was an example of one mixed model where half of the kids were from poor communities and half from wealthy. Um, several years later, they came back to us telling us the, the whole problem it was the disaster, that, that the, the, the program is in serious trouble. Uh, and that's because a class system got built up. Uh, the kids from wealth had uh, a different system, and their parents were starting to get involved. A black market was built up. It was, it was crazy. Another one uh, lowered their expectations and their, their uh, academic standards, and so the kids were underperforming. And so we've seen a lot of those examples. So we're, we're, we're also very cautious about who we're willing to partner with and how we, we work with them. Um, I think scale is a matter of resources. Um, we have to have a will to invest in programs like this that can dramatically change the education and income level and class level of a society. Um, I genuinely believe we can build a number of Shanti Bhavans uh, and uh, help lead them and transform uh, the nation through them. Uh, just talking about resources, I just, uh, you might wonder this is all a uh, very expensive program. No, not really. Uh, you know, we educate them with good number of teachers, uh, um, uh, aunties or caregivers who stay with them and look after them, the, their bedding, their clothing, their uh, medical, their food, uh, recreation, name everything that we give our children, right? It all costs, the cost per child per day is equal to one Starbucks coffee, four and a half dollars. What is the price of Starbucks these days? <laughs> <laughs> four and a half dollars per day is our budget yeah. per child. What so a it is not a lack of resources. The world has got plenty of money, but a commitment to doing it. Mm. I think one of the difficulties too, we run a network of organizations and schools and um, the Shanti Bhavan model is not one that you can impose on an existing organization or with a foundation that's already in existence. It's really something that gets built from the ground up. Right. So it's, it's a struggle for organizations who try to go otherwise. But um, still, when you're talking about 350 kids and 365 days, 
you multiply four and a half, you come up to six hundred thousand dollars budget. Mm -hmm. So you, that's also a problem. That's the resource yeah. issue. And I would be remiss as a moderator if I did not mention that Shanti Bhavan is raising funds for their second school. So okay. if you happen to have your checkbook with you, I don't know. There might be some people. <laughs> um, but I do have time for one last question. Yeah, here. Sorry to take the last question, but uh, thank you for this. Um, what I would like to ask is, when you first started, what markers uh, did you use to measure progress um, and the like, success of the program? And the reason why I'm asking is because I'm from Sierra Leone, West Africa, and I would really like the opportunity to not steal your model, yeah. but <laughs> to implement the idea in itself in West Africa, because um, we want to work with uh, orphan kids um, from, from Ebola uh, stricken areas. So currently right now we're housing seven young girls and what you said was really uh, hitting at the heart because it's about love. And so what we're able to provide to them right now is the home. But one of the things I think, or I would say the thing that makes your stand apart from the rest is actually the educational part. And so mine is trying to figure out how we can implement something of what you guys do back in our own country. And I like the question she had asked because I think it is true, there's a way to have a mentorship program or something like that to learn about some of these steps. Because I know it won't work necessarily the same way, but the truth is, uh, Dr. Abram, you have found a solution to something. And so for those of us in the developing world, we would like to find ways to implement what might work best for us. But not like we want to skim or skim from anything you do, but we want to see if it will actually work in Sierra Leone, West Africa as well. You want, I want to answer this question, because it's a very important question, very... Uh, uh, very meaningful. Uh, I, I don't, you can. You okay, can. I'll. I'll <laughs> uh, um, Gosh, Dad. Uh, there, there, is, there is no uh, s um, a substitute for a good performance. Uh, you can't lower it. If you lower, lower the standard that you want the children, the competence at each level, okay, what they should reach uh, when they, they, they get through second grade, third grade. You have to be very clear. Teachers have to know. Everybody has to know. Uh, you start diluting it, you lost it. Then in the public arena, of course, there is, uh, you know, in India, you have the board exams, national level. 85% we demand that they get that academically. Now, in terms of other skills, uh, leadership skills, communication skills, uh, social grace, uh, and then hu human qualities, humane qualities, such as being kind, generous, um, compassionate, uh, not selfish. That's a little more tricky. That you have to do every day of your life. All the staff have to do. It's not something you can read out from the book and they'll learn every day. <coughs> you cannot have one mistake made. If I told the kids one lie in my 23 years, one lie, stand in front of them and tell one lie, I lost everything. So you, you have to make sure that all the staff buy into that. So the answer is um, in, in bringing them up, that is what it is. But ultimately, the test is where do they end up? Uh, in our case, nobody believed that these kids would end up with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and all these companies, Amazon and so on. Every one of them, every one of them. <coughs> in multinational companies, and some are gone, finish their masters, they're doing uh, MPhil, you know, and so on. Some are in a few countries. So that is the, that is the proof. Uh, that's where you have to get to. So if you start making compromises in these things, then you lost it. Uh, and that needs, uh, you know, all your key people really buying into your mission. We also have a training program in Sierra Leone, so see me after. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately... Can I follow up? Because there's one thing real quick. There's something you do where you go home. Um, I think they are, they're able to go back because it's, it's, it's a boarding school, so they actually come from parents, right? Well, ours, because they're orphans, um, in a sense, it's like we are responsible for them, so we never want to send them back. But what, what touched me was that you were keeping them connected with where they're from because that is the end result. A lot of NGOs, they, you know, you give money, you give scholarships, 
the kids grow up, they do this, and a lot of times they leave the continent and they come back, where you're directing your resources in a sense to get these kids to go back home to where they're from. And we're trying to make sure we can also do that. So it's a little harder because they are orphans, but we're trying to find ways to keep them connected with their communities where they come from so that the end game is that they take the resources and the development and the knowledge back home. Now, it might sound uh, a little cruel for me to say this. Uh, we find the home is one of our biggest problems. Uh, we, they undo in that one month or two months everything we taught them. Uh, and I can give you so many different examples. For example, the father comes uh, having stolen from the village, uh, I mean, the neighbor's vegetable farm, and he comes with a whole bunch of vegetables. And the kid asks, Why, where did you get this? You know, uh, I picked it from uh, so-and-so place. Why did you steal it? Uh, you didn't pay. He said, well, the mother says, um, you, can't, uh, you can't feed with truth alone. Now, how, how, you know, these are realities of poverty. But at the same time, the kid l thinks that stealing is okay. Uh, so sexual abuse, they see uh, women who don't have men, uh, husbands, sleeping with other men every day, different man, because somebody gives some money. All these things are happening. So poverty has its own uh, problems. Uh, but uh, what we hope is the love that the mother gives uh, is a reassurance. So you have to make up, they are orphans, you have to make up with uh, people who have a kind heart. The child can go for a month to that home where they would treat with dignity, with love. And that's a little tough, but sometimes you find in the community people who are willing to take the kids and uh, look after them well during that one month. But then you have a problem to make sure that the, when the kids grow bigger, there is no abuse in that place, you know. It's a complicated business. The whole thing is complicated. We, we train our kids every time they go home with play acting and 50 other things how sexual abuse takes place. Your uncle will come to you, take you to the corner. You know, we, we dramatize this. We go through all this and, uh, just to protect the kid. And when they come back, we have a D, uh, um, what is it? Um, yeah, a debriefing. Uh, what happened at home? And, uh, and then we find some problem. Then we call the parents and then, you know, we, we tell them, we'll put you in jail. You know, we'll, we'll get after you. So, so many things like that happen. And uh, you have a bigger burden because the, you will have to send the kids to strangers' homes, you know. Okay, I know that we all have many more questions and luckily there is a reception after this at which you can ask all of them of our, our two friends. So I just would like to take a moment to thank the two of you for joining me on stage. And thank, thank you, Preston.